Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Key Steps to Internationalising Your Website. Um, my name is Anne White. Oh, typical, the uh, technology isn't working, it's the weather. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Anne White, and I'm Head of International Trade at uh, Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce is the Chamber of Commerce for Berkshire, Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire, Swindon and Heathrow and as we offer a wide range of services uh, to members and non-members. Uh, this, this webinar today comes under our international trade portfolio where we offer a wide range of um, trade related services to all companies within the Thames Valley and beyond. Before I um, hand over to our presenter Claire Snowden today I'd just like to say this webinar is being recorded the um, recording of the session will be made available on our website, thameswalleychamber.co.uk. And if you do have any questions, please use the question and answer session or the chat. I know some people use, like to use the chat um, session and we'll, we'll come to questions um, at a later date in, in the webinar once Claire's made her presentation. So without further ado, I'm just going to turn my camera off because um, the weather's playing a bit of ha havoc with the... Uh, with things at the moment. So I'd just like to tell you about our presenter today, Claire Snowden. Claire Snowden is an experienced business growth and communication specialist with over 30 years of international exposure and operational leadership experience. Claire has lived and worked extensively in Europe, Asia, the Middle East and the Far East where she has developed international business and cultural expertise. She has run Overseas offices supporting manufacturing and operations in both the UK, the US, textiles and fashion, fashion apparel companies in Portugal, Israel, Sri Lanka, Hong Kong and South China. Claire now uses her expertise to support manufacturing and product companies with their business growth and to help UK companies develop their international online presence and grow sales. Today's webinar, Key Steps to Internationalising Your Website, Claire will discuss the steps you will need to take to create a more international leads from your website and improve communications with both existing and potential global clients. At the end of the session, uh, there is an opportunity. Claire's been kind enough to offer delegates today a free international digital health check for their business. All they have to do is connect with Claire and you'll find that out at the end of her presentation and um, she will then arrange that for you. So without further ado, over to Claire. Thank you, Anne. Um, hello, everybody. I'm just uh, be, been struggling this morning, first of all, with the connection and now we display Zoom, settings. the display settings. And of course, it, it's not giving me the display setting that I would like. So just bear with next, me. Next one along in the toolbar, it is. Yeah, it's just not... Um, just not showing me on the toolbar. Okay, another option is at the bottom where the three dots mm. are. You can go onto that. Mm. Yeah. And then high presenter view. That's the one. Thank you, Anne. No problem. Trying to find that. Yeah, it's one of those mornings. Uh, certainly, I've got hay fever. So for those of you who are fellow sufferers, I do, um, I do um, share your share your pain. So hopefully I'll get through the session without too much sniffling and sneezing. Um, it's lovely to be able to present to you today on key steps to internationalizing your website. Um, and if you do want to connect with me on LinkedIn, that would be great. I've, I've made a, a request to us to some of you uh, yesterday. So that would be lovely to be able to continue the conversation if you have more questions. Um, and I will follow up with an email in case you do want to take up the free, the free offer that Anne mentioned. Um, I did have a look at who was on uh, today, and we've got some great companies joining us, a couple of family businesses. Uh, I love working personally with family businesses. I do have a, a number of clients that are family businesses, third and fourth generation. Um, and also very interested to note that we have an, a couple of textile companies on the webinar today, which is really exciting for me because my background uh, corporate career is, is 26 years in the textile and fashion industry. So I always get excited when I see um, textile or, fa or fashion companies joining these types of webinars. And in the past, we used to run them as seminars as well. Do you remember those days, face-to-face um, -face meetings? So hopefully 
we'll be having some of those coming up uh, later in the year. Um, I also had a look at everybody's websites just to see. We've got a great range and breadth of um, expertise. We've got really high level, um, very good um, optimized and internationalized websites right through to starters who aren't even uh, doing anything international on their website. So I will try to cover um, the breadth of the types of differences. So for those of you who are skilled, some of the stuff might be quite basic, but for those who are just starting on their international website journey, they'll need to know that, that information. Um, I will be opening for questions at the end of the session. Um, we will be reviewing uh, the chat box then to see if there's any specific questions. So do, do feel free to, to drop the question in the chat box. Um, so without further ado, I am going to... Um, Just going to stop my video so that I can start the presentation. So why international is good for business? I think you all know because you're on this today's webinar, but just a scene set over the past year, uh, year and a bit now, we've been doing business um, and it's changed significantly. Many businesses have been forced to open up home working, flexible ways of working, and many are seizing the opportunity to do things differently and maximize therefore their technology. Recent statistics for the start of 21 reveal that the number of people buying online is at nearly 30% of the 7.74 billion of the world population, with 60% using the internet, and these numbers are only growing daily. And I'm sure, as myself, you have most probably find, uh, have found over the last year and a bit that you've been buying more online. And so there's a, a vast opportunity for you to be able to therefore sell your products and services if you aren't already or increase that uh, visibility with your international website. So your website's your gateway to business, um, allowing your company to increase your international visibility, attract new leads and customers, as well as facilitate consumer research into your products or services. So when looking to increase export revenue, a well-constructed and international website is fundamental to build relationships with both clients, potential clients, and online search engines. But when looking to internationalize your company's website, where do you start? Claire, can I just say your presentation's not clicking through? Yes, I know. I've just, uh, I'm just trying to work out what the problem is. Let's have a go on this screen. There we go. There we go. So here's today's webinar. This is the first screen. So um, in today's webinar, key steps to internationalizing your website I'm going to share with you ways to develop your web strategy with key steps to help you create, develop, or refine your plan for building your international website with top internationalization features that you must include. Steps that you must take to make your website more effective in your chosen international market or markets. So the website sits at the heart of your company, company's online presence. So when looking to show that you're ready and capable to trade internationally, it's important to make sure you understand the benefits of your product and service to your customer and to be clear on your USPs so that your website is there to attract and initiate a call to action and replace that personal contact. So in case you're in two minds about whether you did need to develop an international website if you're planning to uh, or planning to start or increase your international trade, here are some compelling statistics that you might not be aware of that could support your online presence and communication strategy. So I'm just going to pick out a few because we have quite a short session today. But um, first of all, the UK is currently one of the most advanced e-commerce markets in the world. So that's good that you're sitting in, an, in a location um, or your business is sitting in a location where that's the fact. 70% um, of online searches are not in English. This is sometimes uh, interesting. A lot of people don't, don't realize this, this stat. Um, and this will be mentioned later on when we get to talking about um, internationalization in terms of language and communications. Um, it's also true that customers are four times more likely to buy from a website in their own language. And I don't know about you, but certainly I have visited some um, overseas and um, multi um, country websites over the last year and a bit. And it's certainly sure that I'm always looking to be able to, to view that information in my own language, happens to be English. 
Um, so it applies to other countries. So if you have a particular market that you're that you're focusing on, this is one of the areas you might um, certainly have to look at to be competitive in that marketplace. Um, visitors stay twice as long, by the way, on a website if it's in their own language. And 90% uh, of European um, visitors um, visit local language websites, just a fact, it's what they're looking for. So web savvy SMEs are bringing in double the revenue through exports is a recent stat. So it's helping companies to increase their revenue through international online trade. So I just want to share with you um, internet users by country. Uh, and it's interesting to note that um, countries, uh, sorry, that screen has gone a bit strange gosh it really is playing up today so just just to note that um internet users by country so the top users china india us um indonesia quite high up there this this is normally quite interesting for people that hadn't thought about that market followed by brazil and down through the countries as you can see them so this just helps you to understand how many internet users there are and whether that's a country that that you might uh, focus on therefore and the next slide is about the top languages that are used. So it is true that English is one of the top languages closely followed by Chinese and Spanish and then, then Arabic, but we will get into some of the, the detail on that. Um, I'm going to assume that you already have planned your export strategy because one of the things that, that we need to, to make sure is when we're building or developing on our international website, is that we know what our export strategy is. How am I going to engage with international cu customers? And what products or services am I going to, to market and sell? What markets and locations am I going to focus on? And also interesting to note that you need to be clear on whether you're going to work with distributors, agents, or sell directly, because this will have a direct impact on how your um, international website develops. If you've not done this already, if today is a start of your journey to thinking about international sales and growth with an international website, then I'll just give you some quick um, export strategy tips that you might want to think about. Pick a market or location where you have experience or someone in your team has experience as a starting place. Perhaps you could look at your in-house language skills and this could be a trigger for your focus for your international website. Look back at past or um, services or product sales or deliveries that you've made to see where you've been successfully delivering by default. Do your research and seek help from organizations like the Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce. And these companies can help you and support you with defining your target markets. Check if certain trade rules or requirements in a particular country will support your business and not be too complex for you to start your exporting journey. So you've decided on your export strategy, you've got a website and a lot of people say to me, well, I'm on the World Wide Web, so I can be found, can't I? I'm visible to everybody because it's an international World Wide Web. Well, it's true in one regard, but the fundamental reality of international search is that you're only visible um, to the search engines that you are um, presenting your information to. And perhaps you haven't considered that not all countries have Google as their top search engine. So you'll see here a, a quick uh, visual view of the map showing um, the locations where Google is, but, but some locations where you, Yahoo's in the lead or Yandex or Baidu in China. Um, so this is something you need to be aware of because it has an implication as to your international website development. Now, perhaps you're not sure um, if you can be found. You've got a website. You want to see what somebody in France or somebody in China or somebody in Indonesia sees when they search for your keywords or your type of business or service or product. So you may not be aware, but you can use search engine in, in engines to do this search. And in the, the, in the case of Google, you can review international search, searches using your incognito browser. This will give you a more accurate picture of international searches for your brand name, keyword, or, or products or services. So for exa an example here is you can change your settings to 
Google for Germany, so that's google.de. And then you can set your language and location setting and then do your relevant search. And this will give you an incognito search so you'll get true picture of what people can and can't see. I think you'll be surprised if you do this for your keywords or products or services, you, you might find that in many countries, you just don't come up in the rankings, certainly not on page one. And if you do, well done on the um, international search uh, and creation of your website that you've created so far. So something to keep in mind as a first point. So yes, Google's the number one search engine really globally um, when it comes to the stats, but uh, when it comes to individual countries, this is not the case. For example, here you can see that in China, it is Baidu. Um, and here's some stats showing you how far um, at the top uh, that, that is. And in the case of uh, Russia, you will see that it is uh, um, Yandex. So here's the China, which is Baidu. So it's showing how far ahead, 64%. Using, using Baidu, followed by Soju and Hansu. Um, so this is really clear if this is your marketplace that, that, that Google's not your main focus in terms of your search engine. Here's the one for Russia, which I said is, is Yandex, has almost as big a share as Google, as you can see up here, sort of almost 50-50. So when it comes to selling online, important to understand not only where you're focusing, what countries, what languages, um, what products and services, but also um, when you're presenting your information, are you clear on which search engines are going to be looking and, and finding your information for your potential customers? So when it comes to selling online, um, one of the things that we start with is looking at the three international online marketing principles that people buy from people that they trust, um, that you should put yourself in your customer's shoes and you should think global but act local. So I'm going to explain those in more detail. So the first one, people buy from people that they trust. So when marketing online, we need to make sure that we take into account both people and search engines. So when it comes to Google, one of the search engines out there, amongst other indicators, they use trust rank to rank websites. So the higher your trust rank, the higher the ranking of your site. And trust rank factors include things like quality and number of backlinks, the page rank or the trust rank of the sites that are linking to you, the consistency of your content, the domain age, whether you have a site map, whether you have privacy, legal policies, and whether you have a comprehensive about us section. So search engines are in it for the long game and online, they are your first and most important customer, the gateway to the people that you need to get in touch with. Their reputations are fiercely protected, so your website needs to earn its place and prove its worth with them if you're to reach those potential customers. So when it comes to the uh, people first principle, this refers to whether your company's online presence and specifically whether your website is ensuring that you people feel confident that they can buy from you. Whoops. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, specifically, whether your website is ensuring that a visitor can feel confident about your company and what you are selling and that you have a clear customer service approach. So when it comes to building trust, what puts you off and ultimately what erodes your trust when you're looking at a website? Is it lack of uh, clear call to action, not mobile friendly, um, that's got old content or broken links? When did somebody in your company or you check your current website, health check your current website to see that your website is um, projecting trust. So you need to ensure that your website reflects your capability and your competence. So we're just going to run a quick poll. I think uh, we're going to try anyway. We tried this morning, didn't we, Anne? Hopefully Anne's going to be able to bring the poll up. So here you've got a choice um, of answers. You need to pick one. So what is the number one thing that puts you off and erodes your trust when you're looking at a website? So you've got a number of choices here. And once everybody's had a vote, we can have a look at the percentage share. Oh, 
Okay, so poor design is is currently in in the lead. I know we've got a couple of people that signed up today that will that will be um, watching the webinar on catch up. So um, we may have some other people that that can't vote because they're not currently live. But um, I think everybody's had a chance to vote now. So as we can see, we've got poor design. Let's share the results. Hopefully you can see the results on, on the screen. So we've got poor design is, is certainly 50% um, of you have voted for, for poor design, followed by uh, joint ranking of slow to load and old content. So something to um, think about when you are um, looking at your own website, when you're doing a review of your current website to, to check whether you're happy with design and whether your site is, is quick to load and uh, to check for old content. It's amazing how many websites I do a review of and um, all three things apply, um, particularly um, old, old content. Um, uh, you know, people are busy running their, their businesses and sometimes the website lags behind and um, it's really important to, to show the latest information of all the great things that you're doing as a company. Okay. So. The next um, slide is about um, putting yourself in your customer's shoes. So our marketing principle number two, um, put yourself in your customer's shoes. Are you clear on your customer profile and are you showing how much you care about your customers? Do you speak their language? Now, to put language into context, I mentioned earlier, out of the world's 7.5 billion inhabitants, only 7% speak English as a first language. And most of these people aren't native English speakers with only about 360 million speaking English as their first language. So your customers want to know how much you understand and care about them. And research shows that your website in the local language has the potential to increase sales by 400%. Visitors to your website want to not only be able to trust you and understand what you're saying, but also what you can do for them. So you need to focus on the benefits to them and not just explain what you do, which is quite common on websites for people to lay out what they do as opposed to lay out what they can do for their customers. Research shows that you have less than 1.7 seconds to capture a visitor's attention before they leave a website. And they will normally have two key questions that need to be answered to stay and follow a call to action. Number one question, is this page relevant? Have you got what I want? And number two question, do I trust this site? So what does your website show to your local and international visitors? And does it have what they want and project what they want? Principle number three, think global, act lo local. Global competition demands that your website is properly localized in order to succeed internationally and to be able to compete on a local level. Successful international businesses understand that a one-size-fits-all approach doesn't work when delivering products and services across different markets. Creating goodwill and establishing credibility with local markets is critical if you want to prosper. So localization is where a business actively seeks to differentiate its global products and services and communicates to individual markets and regions to embrace and accommodate those differences. Done correctly, this leads to improved results such as increased return on investment, awareness and engagement. So does your website have localized content and cater to the needs of your international customers by location? In other words, are you easy to do business with? Are you easy to find, easy to contact and easy to do business with? So you have your online presence, you've done your three online marketing principles. You should also check about whether you are easy to find and do business with. So we are sure to ensure that potential customers can find us, 
and ensure that they can engage with our online content and calls to action. So what steps, steps can you take to develop your international web strategy? So this is quite a complicated um, slide. Uh, it takes a while to focus in on. It's really showing the evolution of an international web strategy. And um, it's important to note that you'll all be at different stages on this journey. Some might be at the very beginning, which is the, the bottom left of your screen, which is where you have an, a, a UK website on a .co.uk um, country localized website with UK oriented information in UK English. Um, and some of you may be totally international with a localized site where you've got either local websites, local domains with local content, local links, and you are optimizing using local language and content. Um, many companies that we start with are, are over at the beginning. They're a UK website wanting to convert into an international website. Um, and we take them through the journey of starting off by in step one, thinking global. That is looking at maybe adding international pages, um, starting the first steps of their international website journey, perhaps optimizing using something called Global English, which I'll refer to later, before they move into a total local website. So if you just keep this in mind that there's a bit of an evolution, it's never ending really, it's a never ending feast, but there's a bit of a journey to get from a UK site to a truly global international website. So when we're talking about international strategies, um, and websites, um, how can we create a checklist that, that we, can, we can review? Um, we've talked about the journey of a website from a UK-centric to a truly uh, optimized um, international website. So some of the things that you might want to, to think about, if you're on a .co.uk, perhaps you need to think about uh, a generic top-level domain, a .com or a .global. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware that uh, .co.uk is by nature a UK targeted or country location website. Um, quite difficult to therefore start adding content for say China. Um, whereas with a .com you can create different kinds of structures to add content to your website. Uh, perhaps you're just starting out and, and, and your first step might be to have an international section on your website. Um, or you might start by adding country specific pages or language specific pages. Perhaps you're not quite ready to have a local country code domain, um, for example, your company.fr um, with local content and languages. Certainly that can add complexity and cost, but certainly if you're truly looking to internationalize, that would be the, the place to go. You also need to think about your domain strategy I mentioned earlier, a doc, having a .com, a generic top level domain, um, perhaps reserving other generic top level domains um, so that other people uh, can't muscle in on your, on your um, online presence. Um, looking at, at perhaps local country code domains um, for your brand word or your company name. So for example, www.training.fr or local country code domains where you can um, use brand or keywords. Um, so for example, um, formation.fr um, for your website in France. Um, keeping in mind that as you grow as a company, you may be looking to um, start in one country and in develop and grow into other countries. So think about other domain names that you might want to have in the future and think about buying those and keeping them in your armory so that they aren't uh, open to being bought by other companies and traders. So I mentioned some of these um, strategies, uh, web strategies and domain strategies. So here's some live examples. Um, here's an example of an international section. So this is Oxford Brooks and they have um, added an international section so that international students or anybody that's wanting to know about um, Oxford Brooks from, from overseas can, can go into this section and there will be specific information that relates to them. Here's an example of tech equipment, a directory structure with flag navigation. And I did look at, as I mentioned, I looked at your websites earlier. So we have got somebody um, on today who's got a website that's using um, 
country um, um, country domains, country navigation with, with flags. Uh, one of the things to be aware of with flags is if you are using a language um, uh, strategy that you might want to think about not using flags, but actually using the, the, the language term. Um, so for example, if you are uh, optimizing for Spanish as a language, you might want to, to think about not using the Spanish flag because I'm sure you're aware that there are more uh, language speakers uh, in the world than just those in Spain. Um, you potentially would therefore be alienating a large population, say for example, in South America, if you were only using uh, the Spanish flag. So just to think about your navigation, um, but also to think about the structure. So here you can see that this uh, company, Tech Equipment, have a uh, generic top level domain, uh, which is a .com, and they've created a directory structure. So here is showing their Germany page. So that's a forward slash DE with then the German content. Um, you can see that that's translated down below. And they've, they've done this for a number of, of, of countries and, and languages. Something you might consider. Here we've got a company called uh, Duolingo, um, language uh, company. They've actually used a subdomain um, structure. So you can see that the uh, FR is before the generic top level domain, duolingo.com. Um, it's a preference. Uh, some, some people, some companies use this, but you can say it's, you can see on this site, it's very, very clear the different languages that they're offering, the different sites. You've got the navigation over on the right hand side and the flags at the bottom as well showing um, the different countries that, that they are covering. So these are all considerations that you might have in terms of your um, domain structure, your web structure, and also the, the content on your actual site. Here's the um, Visit Melbourne uh, website. Um, and this is what I referred to earlier. They're actually a language website and it clearly um, shows they're using a drop-down menu that is um, language specific. So you can um, click on the relevant language that you want. And also important to note that the language is also translated. So the, 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 the drop-down is also in the language of the person um, that, that, that's doing the search on your website, as opposed to writing the English version of Chinese, for example, so important to note. And here's a really interesting um, site, Airbnb, ever, ever moving, ever changing, quite interesting to, to, to keep looking at. Here's their um, UK site on the .co.uk. And then um, you will see that they have added their um, different sites for different countries. Here's the German site. Um, they've used the, the template strategy. You'll see that um, pretty much using the same uh, visuals, um, the same structure, the same layout, but adding the different um, content for the different country sites, um, which helps to, um, to, to make this a, a, an easier um, website build if you've got, uh, say, multiple countries, which obviously Airbnb do, um, because they are truly global uh, website with global presence. So there are some considerations, uh, and also, um, um, in, and they, sorry, I've got got to show you this, the, the language and the region. So you've also got a drop-down menu where you can actually physically go in and choose both language and region. The same applies to British Airways. Um, British Airways, you can go in and look for both country, region, and language. Now, this might be far beyond where you are in terms of your company strategy, but it's something to think about creating structure today so that in the future, as you grow as a business, you might be able to have these types of um, website uh, strategies going forward. So where to, you've got these websites, you've got your structure, you've got your layout, you, you've decided which countries you're focusing on, which markets, which products and services you're going to be presenting to the world. So, so then the next thing is, is really important to know your keywords and your key, key phrases. Now, I'm hoping that you've done this for your UK market. Um, so you have some experience. Um, and then you just take the same type of approach for your international keywords for the different languages in the different markets. So for example, a keyword, even if it's in English for the UK market, will be very different for, for example, the US market. Now I had a client who was dealing in farm machinery and you would think the language would be the same, but actually not only um, the types of equipment, but also the types of, um, work that they do, uh, the language is totally different. So even though it was the same type of market, 
they had to change all the language for their US site. So keyword research, if you haven't done it and you're not quite sure, here's some quick tips for, for, for starting you on your keyword research. So first of all, do your keyword research and keyword uh, key phrase research in um, your in English. Um, look for your British English and global English, which I'll describe a little bit later and check your Google Analytics report um, and your AdWords uh, for the keywords, you will find that the search on these reports, these are both free reports from, from Google, the search engine, um, you will find the keywords that people are using to use your site. Um, so that gives you a head start to know that these are these available keywords in those locations. You can do a, a, a search on Google Trends. Um, you can also um, look at uh, the search engines themselves, Google, Yahoo, Bing, um, and have a look at, at, at your competitors, all those marketplaces. You can research those competitors and see what keywords they're using. There are actually tools out there for researching competitor keywords. Um, some, um, most of them paid, but there's a few free tools out there. You could talk to your international customers if you have them or agents or distributors or partners or people that you know have expertise in those markets to have a, 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 bear, an under, a bearing and understanding from them as to what the keywords and key phrases might be. You might look at brainstorming, um, thinking about both technical and non-technical words. You could use keyword um, research tools. Um, there are many available and listen to your customers or always listen to, to your customers. So you've got these wonderful keywords and key phrases, great for search, great for search optimization, but where do you put them? Well, you put them in the content, of course, you, you, you write the relevant content. You, you, you have them displayed on your website in the content, but, but more specifically, you need to think about adding them not only to your content, but also your titles, your descriptions, your keywords, your, your alt tags in the build of the website, in your headings, in your files and, and URL um, names, in your image and fi video file names. Um, if you've got any PDFs, they need to be mentioned. Um, clearly in the website copy, which I think everybody knows about. Um, if you've got a glossary, you need to make sure that they're, they're referred to in the glossary or, or, or FAQs. Um, if, if you have an FAQ section, make sure you have them in your links, in your sitemap, in navigation, if you have it, breadcrumb navigation, and in any um, navigation tabs or tools that you might be using, all to feed the juice of um, um, the content of your site for the search engines to find. So you've got wonderful keywords. People are finding you. They're coming to your website. It's fabulous. So now what? They're at my website. They're looking. Hopefully they're staying for more than 1.7 seconds. But we need to make sure that not only have we done that great work to capture them, they're finding our site. They're coming there. They're staying for a little period of time. But we need to make sure that we've got clear calls to action. We need to, to, to help the person to know um, what it is that, that, that they can do in terms of the information we're sharing up. So it might be as simple as emailing me emailing you or asking them to fill in a form so you can capture their details. It might be if you have the service to support it that you want them to call you or Skype with you or Zoom with you or live chat with you. Um, you might be using a tool um, that, that, that's got an ask a, a, a chat tool with an ask advisor. Uh, you might just want them to follow you on, or, on link with you on social media so that you can uh, you can track their, um, that they can track and you can track their content, or you might want them to recommend or forward to a friend. These are just a few of the calls to action. Now, the thing about calls to action is you need them and you need them in the relevant pages on your, uh, on your site, but you need to make sure you don't have too many, you don't confuse people. Um, so, so we're really saying have, have a clear call to action on each page and it might be different for different pages. There's more, <laughs> get a quote. Um, that's a, that's a really important one. If you're selling, um, a product online, but you're not prepared to share your pricing. We work with a number of educational companies who are selling, for example, educational equipment. So they're not putting their prices up because, um, you know, they're not sure it's not a one-off sale. It might be product for the building of a new educational wing. Um, but they also don't want their competitors to see. So they, they go through a service called, uh, uh, get a quote so that the they can get the company to contact them directly, get the quote, and then they can start the conversation offline um, to, to hopefully uh, move them into a sales position. Um, it might be that you want them to um, try something now. You might be offering a 30-day trial. Um, you might just want them to buy now. 
uh, clearly on an e-commerce site, you know, you, you've got your product, the person's come to your site, they're clearly looking for something, otherwise they wouldn't be there, and you just want them to buy. Um, so just be clear on the different calls to action and the ones that make sense for your business. So we've got all this wonderful activity going on. Um, we've, we've, got our, uh, we've got our structure, we've got our content, we've got our keywords, people are finding us because we've got the right search engine optimization on our site. So then they come, um, but we need some tips, don't we? We need to know about search engine optimization. What, what is it that, 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 that we need to, to be aware of, certainly in 2021? And here's a quick snapshot um, from a company called SEMrush showing the latest SEO tips for 2021. So the, the fact that AI is taking a greater role, uh, more and more companies using this, not only in terms of their product and service, but also in terms of their online, um, online presence. Um, voice is impacting, uh, mo mobile friendly. That's just uh, always been the case for the last few, few years, but that, that's critical now that your website is mobile friendly and that it, and that it loads on different, um, different um, services, different, uh, different phones, different iPads, different uh, applications. Um, content, uh, making sure it fulfills the Google Eat principle. This has been around for a while, but for those of you who don't know, the EAT principle is that you're showing that you have expertise for E, authority for A, and trustworthiness for T. And I touched on some of those earlier. Um, long form content. Content is um, ranking higher, long form content, but the long form content has to be relevant and engaging. It can't just be um, long for the sake of uh, stuffing uh, information out there. It's got to be relevant. Um, predictive search is set to improve and uh, they're already changing the algorithms on some of the search. I don't know whether you've, you've noticed those changes already. Um, effective search engine optimization strategies clearly in this day and age have to include uh, video and imagery, um, certainly um, high ranking. In some cases you will find that, that um, YouTube channel of a company ranks higher than their website. That's a good example of why video is important and um, making sure you have local search listings. Uh, again, from an international point of view, if you are wanting to be uh, found in, in a particular country, you need to make sure you're also not only in your UK search listings, but also in um, those uh, international countries that you're focusing on and making sure that your data and analytics um, uh, are priority to ranking well. So here's some SEO tips. I'm just gonna take a drink. for 2021 that, that will help you on your um, internationalization SEO journey. So I also want to mention um, about language, uh, mind your language. Um, I've re referenced language in a number of um, parts of the presentation so far. Uh, important to mind your language and your manners when you're online. <clears throat> and don't be lost for words in international markets. In English in, in US, for example, I, I referred to it to a company in the US uh, earlier. Um, in in, in um, English US, 4,000 words means something different in American English to UK English. That's just a good example to show that you might write one word, but it's taken as a having another meaning. Um, and I used to work for an American fashion corporation and I've, I've fallen into this trap uh, m many, many times. Some of them, some of them quite hysterically funny. Um, for example, um, the word the word rubber. For those of you who might uh, know those implications, <laughs> that certainly happened for me. Um, so, what's the case for language? How many of you have purchased in a foreign language in the past few months? I would imagine it's quite rare, quite minimal. So, it's important to get translation right on your website if you're going for uh, local language, and be sure to have well written, clear, and localized and properly translated content, not Google Translate. Um, Google Translate certainly is not something that we would recommend. It's clearly not best practice. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever looked at a website where you've seen um, something that's been translated from a, a foreign language into English, and you'll see how poor the representation is. It is getting better, and language translation tools are getting better, but still Google Translate, if you just did a, an, uh, did a trial yourself from a foreign language into English, you would see lots of errors and mistake and not really helping to build that reputation and, and trust that we mentioned earlier. 
Um, but if you're not ready to translate, and some companies aren't, there's a cost and a time implication attached, you could just start by translating a section. You could just have an international section with one page of translated content, for example. Or you could do what I mentioned earlier, and that is write in international English as your first step on your language journey. International English or global English, you can, you can Google this. I'll look for it on a search engine. You'll come up with lots of examples. But here are our top seven um, key changes for international English. You need to reduce the volume of content. This is, this is basically, if you think about it, you've got somebody coming to your website. You're not prepared to, yet to, to go to a foreign language, but you want somebody maybe second language English to be able to understand your website when they come there and, and therefore be able to do the, 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 the call to action. So think about reducing the volume of content, keeping the sentences short, simplifying the language. So for example, in the case of um, a human resources, doesn't necessarily translate well to second language English. You might use the word staff. Uh, avoid jargon, acronyms, slang inside a talk. Um, lots of companies just love their acronyms. Um, it's great if you want to use them, but make sure there's a, there's a, a, a glossary or an explanation of what they stand for. Uh, provide visual support. Um, as they say, a picture speaks a thousand words. So it might be that you've got a complex process or a complex product that you want to describe, perhaps a video or, 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 a, or an image or a diagram of that process uh, will be more easier for people to understand on the website. Use bullets, underlinings and bold to make it clear and short and concise and don't make assumptions. Um, we find a lot of people do, do these things. Um, they write their website with their understanding but haven't gone out to other people, perhaps people with those, those particular different language skills to check for understanding whether it makes sense to them. So keep that in mind, always be checking. So as I said, a picture speaks a thousand words. And um, I wanted to um, just give a, a visual example of a company, um, uh, um, Nescafe, who um, give great examples of um, using images that are culturally sensitive for different audiences. Um, you also need to be aware that, that not all countries have high speed internet access, which means that flash animations or bandwidth sapping graphics may be an issue to load. And uh, so we now live in a world where we uh, need to ensure that our website can, can, can load quickly. So it's imperative to, to be aware of those situations. So Nescafe is a good example. The website has a country and a language um, selector. And I want to just share with you the differences of their imagery and their um, a web experience for different uh, countries. So this is the UK site, um, a particular type of image that wouldn't work well in um, perhaps Arabic uh, speaking locations, um, quite a clean um, front page. Uh, if we then move on to the China site, uh, you'll see that um, uh, there's nothing offensive in terms of this image. It's just trying to show um, the, 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 the coffee situation and um, uh, it's, uh, it's not going to be offensive to anybody and it's clearly in, in the local language. And then the Arabic site, um, really clever, I, I thought, that they've used um, e emojis, they've used um, references and emoji and little diagrams, um, emoji diagrams to, to represent uh, the, the coffee um, experience. And they've taken out the... Um, uh, blotted out the, the, the background um, image so that there can be no uh, issues for um, cultural inappropriateness. Um, and this sits very well in that marketplace. So you can be creative with the imagery and the content um, of your different sites for your different countries to be able to, to meet the needs of those particular website visitors. Um, so we're, we're coming uh, close to, to the end. Uh, of, of today's webinar, I always want to, to finish on making sure that you have, you have an action plan, something to take away, um, ensure that you, you've, maybe you've written some notes, maybe there are some things that have resonated with you. It might just be that you're going to go and check your current website for, for, for the top three things um, of our poll. Um, or, 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 or it might be that you're going to um, uh, do a quick health check, uh, get someone else to look at your website and tell you what they think. Um, before you start to, to, to look at internationalizing. So take your action plan, prioritize the actions um, 
one chunk at a time, allocate your budget. Um, some of these things do take budget and require funding. Um, look at roles. Some of it you may be able to do in-house. Some of it you will definitely need to outsource. And some of it you may be able to be creative with um, apprenticeships, temporary um, support, uh, student help. There's a lot of students out there that want, want to, to, to complement their project and their studies, study work. Um, and always look to get feedback on each step of the journey that you take. So a quick reminder of the, the, the top um, points or key steps that we've mentioned in this webinar on internationalizing your website. Number one, ensure that your website can be found. So all that juicy stuff on search engines um, is really important, uh, making sure you understand your marketplaces. Number two, develop trust with both visitors and search engines. A lot of people focus on one and not the other. Some companies really skilled, <clears throat> excuse me, focus on search engines and forget about the visitor and vice versa. Number three, put yourself in your customer's shoes. It's about them, not about you. Number four, think global, but act local. You're competing with people in different countries, so you need to understand the local market um, in their different uh, global location. Number five, mind your language and manners. So if you are taking the language route, perhaps you're starting with international English, um, you're needing to be culturally aware of things like images and content, uh, but, but, but also making sure that the people that find your site uh, can understand what it is you're trying to say to them and you have a call to action. And, and number six, have a plan. Come away from the um, webinar today with at least your top two, three, four, five things that you're going to do um, for your international website journey. So that concludes the um, presentation part of today's webinar. Um, and did mention kindly at the beginning that um, for these sessions for Thames Valley Chamber, we do always offer a free international digital health check. Uh, what you will get is a, is a, is a, is a 20 minute conversation where I'll present to you um, a, a benchmark website audit score for your website. So a live um, uh, diagnostic tool that we run that gives you a scoring of your current website as a, an understanding of where you're at. And then we will give you and share with you three tailored international website development tips. Um, and it'd be the start of a conversation. Um, and uh, we find that, that um, many companies that, that do take part find that it very valuable as a starting point to help bring some clarity to where they're currently at and, and some top things that they might be able to do today to internationalize their website. So I'm going to hand back to, to Anne. Um, don't forget to link with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to carry on the conversation with you. Um, that's my LinkedIn um, code there. Thank you, Claire. Thanks, Anne. Um, my so a couple of questions obviously we've um I'm just going to put my camera back on so you can see me we've um obviously we we hold these webinars fairly regularly with uh -huh. over the over the years and every time i sit and i learn something different because those things are always constantly changing and there's a couple of people that have asked you know as things move so quickly how often should they do a, a, a view per se of their website you know we know things are ongoing but how how often should they do a, a sort of major review if possible yeah i think um it i think the, the the quick answer to that would be to build it into your business planning um what we find is a lot of the times that business have them separately they run their business and then because they're perhaps um perhaps they outsource their website to a company they see it separate and so they're busy busy working doing all this great stuff developing a new product, developing a new service, going into a new market, they've got you know, great contract or something. They're over here doing that and they forget that the people that are looking at them as a business are looking at their online presence, their social media as well, but pro um, uh, uh, prominently their website. So we say that it, it, it should be part of the business strategy, development strategy, the day-to-day. -day. So even if you outsource to a company, Make it part of your, if you're having a weekly meeting about the business development or you're having a monthly uh, meeting of the whole team and you're talking about this is what we did this, this month. Remember that that's important key information for your online presence and your website build. So that'd be one way to do it. Uh, the, the other way to do it would be if you are outsourcing that part of your contract is that you have 
a monthly review. Um, we've worked with many companies and actually a lot of them engineering companies who have these great contracts with, with some very large concerns um, who are charging them a lot of money <laughs> on a monthly basis, but not really getting the service that they should get. Um, they're not really, it's not built into the contract to have a review on a monthly basis of the website. You know, diagnostic tool running on your website will tell you straight away if there's, a, if there's an issue, it doesn't take very long. Um, somebody taking a quick look, oh my goodness, that's old now. You know, that, that webinar that we had three months ago, that should be removed. So it's really a, a, a monthly part of your monthly strategy, your business strategy, but also having somebody who's got a role and responsibility. If that's an external person, make sure their contract includes health check and reviews of your website on a timely basis. If it's internal, make it part of that, that function that every, uh, every uh, month for sure that the website's reviewed, but certainly if there's a page that's got events on it, that it's updated on a, on a weekly basis. Fantastic. And then uh, we've had a, another question come in from uh, Raj and Raj has asked, and I'm not sure if it's one that you would advise on or not, but, you know, if when you update your website, how, you know, should you be keeping an archive of old versions and, or not? Or, and if you, if you do, what's best practice in that? Um, yeah, it dep depends what you are putting on your website. <laughs> So um, in the case of, of event, if you're running events or, 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 or offers, then uh, it's important for you to have that uh, understanding and continuity of, of information. You can take that offline. Um, once you've completed it, you can keep that in, in a digital source. Um, I mean, offline, off, off the website. Um, in terms of, of website versions, um, part of your, um, uh, 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 what do you call it? part of your um, uh, IT policy, your, your, your uh, policy for your um, uh, online content should be that you have some kind of service that's making sure you don't lose data. Um, so for example, if your website got shut down tomorrow for some reason or corrupted and it, and it was not there anymore, you need to be able to reinstate it. So you need to be using some, some kind of uh, software tool or your web developer or the person that, that's handling your IT and your web for you. Needs, need, you need to make sure that they have the service that, that if something goes wrong, that your website is captured. Um, I certainly use that in terms of um, my, um, my online, all my online activities captured um, daily. Um, I think my service runs at midnight and it captures all my uh, online information um, SOS emergency tool, basically. It's uh, making sure I don't lose data. Fantastic. So I'm conscious of time. And uh, so thank you very much, Claire. As informative as ever, there's always, as I said, things to pick up regardless. Things change all the time. I'm just wanting to cover a couple of things in relation to the chamber. Um, and, and can I just ask a yes. quick question? Would it be can. possible to, what, what we can do is um, if we can capture those um, questions, Yes. there's a few more uh, yes. that we don't have time for. If we can capture those, I can um, write to the people yeah, directly. Yeah, that's not a problem, Claire. That's okay. Problem. okay, thanks. Thank you. So I'm just going to mention, um, I said earlier today that uh, at the beginning of the webinar that we have a, a webinar archive, um, which this webinar will be put on. It's just available on our website. You just see it there um, on, on the right-hand side. It also gives all of the webinars we've been doing lately at the Chamber, so there might be some that have been other ones that have been interest to yourself. And on the left-hand side, it's just our, our events web page, which is constantly updating because we do a lot of events and, uh, and training courses. And so if there's anything of any interest, just have a look and book those through, through that uh, our website. So that is my contact details. If anyone has any uh, inquiries in relation to any aspects of international trade, entering new markets or trade facilitation, please contact me or my team at that uh, location. We will send out a link to the webinar to yourselves for anyone that's attended today. And or, um, so that will, you can look at it at your own leisure. So I would just like to thank Claire again for a um, wonderful presentation. And I'd like to thank you all for attending and I hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice to see you all. I'll see you on the other side, hopefully on LinkedIn.